Hi everyone, I'm thriller author J.F. Penn and today I'm here with Simon Toyne. Hi Simon. Hello again. <laughs> again, you mean. It's our, our second run, second interview, and just a little introduction in case anyone doesn't know Simon. Simon is the author of the Sunday Times best-selling Sanctus trilogy, and the books have been translated into 28 languages and published in 50 countries. And Simon's latest book is The Searcher, the first in the new Solomon Creed series, and I have an advanced copy. <laughs> Very exciting, lovely cover. So, um, all brilliant, Simon. So, first of all, just give us a bit of an overview of the new book so people have a sense of what it's about. Uh, well, it's um, the main character, Solomon Creed, who is the main, so it's a new series character. Um, and he's a man, effectively, on an epic journey of uh, redemption. Um, and he actually arrives at the beginning of the first book, we're clueless as to how he's got there, walking down the middle of an Arizona road towards a town called Redemption. Uh, and behind him is a burning plane, and he's got an emergency vehicles screaming towards him, and all, all he kind of knows, he knows nothing about himself at all. All he has is this burning sensation um, that he is there to save this man. Uh, this na Then his name of this man pops up, and uh, as the cars pull up and the police get out and say, were you on the plane? Are you all right? All this kind of stuff. He um, he mentions this guy and says, I think I'm here to save him. And the uh, chief of police says, but we buried him this morning. And so um, so that's kind of how the book kicks off. So so you know, the, the, the central kind of mystery of the first book is how do you save a man who is already, already dead? Yeah, which, and then the book turns out to be a lot more than that, which is uh, pretty it's exciting. A, it's, it's a complicated book, and you've read it, I know, which is very good. <laughs> What I was really interested in, because of course I read all your Sanctus books and I'm, I've been a fan for years, um, but your Sanctus series featured this town of ruin, which for many people, um, certainly in my mind, became quite, you know, is the thing that I remember from the Sanctus books. And now you have redemption. So how important is sense of place to your writing in general? And tell us a bit more about redemption. Uh, well, sense of place is hugely important for me because I think, you know, if you don't, um, well, cause, cause environment for, um, forges character. So if you don't have a sense of the environment, then you are missing a lot of, uh, tricks really as, as regards character and setting. Um, I mean, with Ruin, it was kind of accidental that I created the town of Ruin um, for the trilogy. Um, I, I really tried to find a place that would fit the story, and I just couldn't find one. You know, there was nothing that quite worked, and I felt really bad about um, taking a real place and sort of taking too much liberties, too many liberties with it to try and make it fit my story. So in the end, I just decided to create this place, which was really hard because, you know, you have to create a whole history and mythology. You have to sort of, you know, kind of make sure... It looks right, the food's right, everything and all that. So, so you're kind of grabbing bits from lots of real places to create this fantasy, really, and make it feel real, um, which is what you do with all of your fiction, really. You know, your characters are figments, but you do whatever you can to make them feel real. So this time around with this, uh, because this guy can pretty much travel everywhere, and he sort of travel. he's sort of, the whole notion of Solomon Creed is that you're not quite sure who he is or indeed what he is, you know, whether he's delusional, whether he's reincarnated, whether he's an angel, whether he's a devil, whether he's just some kind of like you know sort of drifting kind of kind of genius loser because he's he has enormous knowledge but knows nothing about himself and i genuinely genuinely wanted to set it somewhere real i thought you know particularly if i've got this this quite this cipher of a character it'd be really good to put his feet on the ground somewhere real and i loved arizona and i liked that sort of elemental walking out of the desert thing and the kind of connotations of the of westerns um and um and so I went to Arizona. I'd been to Arizona before, but never specifically looking for this kind of town. So I went there on a, on a trip um, and spent a good couple of weeks going around, taking pictures, uh, really trying hard to find this very specific town, um, which I thought I would because I did lots of pre-research and had a kind of hit list of places to go, ghost towns, ex-mining towns, all of which I knew needed to be part of the story. And again, none of them were quite right. None of them, they were all, they were all a bit near misses. And, and I, I have started feeling these pangs again of, if I, if I take such liberties with a real place, I'm going to get into trouble, I'm going to feel bad. And, and also, I think actually, crucially, I, I would know it wasn't real. So in a way, cutting myself loose and allowing myself to have total free reign and inventing a place again, mm -hmm. snatched from lots of these bits, um, felt like the right thing to do. Um, and, it, and it was in the end, and it wasn't, it's not, a, you know, it's a smaller town than, I mean, ruins a huge city with like, you know, 
thousands and thousands of years worth of history and this place has just got like about a, you know 150 years worth of history you know it's sort of it, it came about at the time when arizona stopped being a territory and started being a state and um at the time when the copper came in and all that which is tied in with the story as well so i kind of liked that can after with the previous the trilogy as well dealing with huge spans expanses of history it was quite nice to do deal with a you know, with history in 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 recent memory, in living memory, almost, um, which was a, a change. But you know, place is hugely important for me. As you know, I think we're all of us. You know, the same with the books you write as well. You need to kind of um, place these things in very very vivid uh, environments. Otherwise, it's they almost the fantasies we're spinning just do spin away a bit too much. You have to anchor it in something solid. So so yeah, it's crucial. Um, I, I kind of I, I I spend as much time, if not more, on place as I do on the characters. Mm, I think well, the place is a character. It is a character, indeed. Yeah, really, in in your book, and we uh, we'll come back to what's next. But you know, you've really now you've had ruin and redemption. You've really set the stage for like your future books. You can never have a place without a really cool name. <laughs> beginning with R as well. Oh, Clear. beginning with R. <laughs> ruin redemption. I don't know. Uh, well, some kind of symbolism Redicio. as well. You know, I, I think the symbolism in in both the names you use and also. Um, well, there's, there's a lot of symbolism in the book as well. That's probably a bit too deep and meaningful. <laughs> but- no, no, but it's, no, I think you're right, though. And I use a lot of symbols because I think the thing is, if you pick certain symbols, um, what you're trying to do is kind of shortcut um, emotional and um, pre-existing knowledge uh, sort of bases in the reader. And symbols, you know, like a, a cross, a cruciform Latin cross is a very powerful symbol because everyone understands it. You don't need to explain it. You can just have it in the story and then pass on. So I, I try and pick these emblematic places and these, um, I, I just try and, yeah, I, I, I write, I'm very visual and so I have to see it first. And symbols are a really big part of um, of anchoring it again to kind of a real sense of, of concrete reality. Mm. Well, you come from a TV background, don't you? So is visual the visual mode is something that you're quite natural in? Yeah, but I, th- I kind of think it's the other way around. I think I, beca- I moved into television because I already was quite visual. And I, so, and I think even writing, you know, writing now where the story is conveyed entirely through the written word, I still have to pre-visualize everything. I have to see it. I have to kind of be able to see my characters and see the streets they're walking down so that I know, even if it doesn't end up in the book, it often end- ends up in the first draft. You know, I overwrite and dis- over-describe, partly because I'm trying to make sense of it myself. It's, you know, it's like if you go to a place for the first time, you do a lot of looking around because it's mm. unfamiliar when you go there a second time you don't do the same you, you, you might focus on a few things but you don't do the same amount and it's, I think it's the same you do a first draft and you're looking around everywhere the second draft you're like no they're the bits that are important and you get rid of everything else and mm. um, yeah so I, I think it's there in the book if not sort of explicitly Mm. And you mentioned there that environment forges character. And uh, so I wondered about your environment and how that forges your character. Because you, you write in a, quite a, you're right now in an unusual place, aren't you? Tell us about that. Uh, I am in France. It's not that unusual. Um, but no, it's, it's fine. I, I, well, my story, which is kind of, you can go on my website and the whole story is there. I won't retell the whole thing. But um, I, because, yeah, I worked in television and I always wanted to write a book. But the trouble is I had so, TV was fairly full on and I was, I was an exec. So I was kind of quite high level with lots of stuff to do. And I just didn't have any free time. And I, I as I was approaching 40, I had a kind of mind and midlife crisis of the, what am I doing? What happened to that novel that I, pro- I thought I was going to do? Um, sort of go in the spare room and try and, you know, bash out a book. Um, I um, decided with my family that we would just go on an adventure because then if the book failed, which, which let's face it, it had every chance of doing, at least we'd have had an adventure and I could, you know, sort of sweep the book failure under the carpet of uh, the adventure that we'd had. Um, and because we both spoke a bit of French and because we sort of, France was handy and we could drive to it and it was, you know, easy to get back to see relatives and for people to visit, we just decided to hire somewhere in France. So um, we we just kind of picked a place, rented it, hired out our place in, in Brighton and, and we moved here for six months um, and I wrote a big chunk of what became Sanctus. Um, and I, do, I don't know whether it's sort of, it's kind of, this is the place I went to to write my first book. But then ever since, we um, ended up coming back here on holiday um, every summer, even though, you know, we could have gone anywhere. We always ended up coming back here. And I always ended up kind of like being very inspired here and writing. The place I'm, I live in a little place called um, Cord, Cord Circiel, which means Cord on the Sky, uh, which is a oh, hill. Lovely. Eh? And it was so cool because it's a, it's a hill town in the middle of a valley. And in the morning, uh, the, the valley fills with mist and the top of the hill is just visible. So it looks like a night. So it looks like it's floating on clouds. 
Um, and um, I always, whenever we came around holiday, I always have loads of ideas and I'd write loads. And it was just, you know, it was, um, it was a very inspirational place. And so ultimately what happened was we bought a place and I'm in it now. We bought a little place that my wife's an interior designer. So we always buy total wrecks. And when we bought this, there were like about 50 pigeons living in the roof because the roof was like a colander and the electrics were lethal and all that kind of stuff. Um, and I come here, we come here, I mean, because I can, I'm a full-time writer, we come here during all the kids' holidays. I mean, I just carry on working. So we're here for six weeks in the summer, which sounds like the most brilliant holiday ever, um, except they have six weeks of lovely time and I just lock myself away in my room. So it's, like, <laughs> it's just hotter as far as I'm concerned and the food's nicer when I stop work. In fact, it's kind of gloomy here at the moment because not because of the middle of the night, but because I'm sitting by an open window to get a bit of breeze, and the shutters are shut because it's like ninety, I'm ninety eight degrees or something out there at the moment. It's just boiling hot. The kids are off down the road at a pool, um, uh, cooling off and being quiet and letting me work. Yeah, well, you know, you're, the opening scene is you know a plane crash and lots of flames in the middle of the Arizona desert. So maybe that heat. is shaped by your environment. Well, maybe heat. <laughs> Yeah, no, I just, um, it's fun well, because it's a series. And, um, you know, when I was sort of thinking about uh, the different books uh, right from the beginning of like how I can differentiate each, each book. Um, and at the moment, it's going to be a five book series, but I d it's kind of open ended because, I, you know, it's sort of, um, I know where, I know who he is, I know who Solomon is. Um, but when, when that re is revealed and the upshot of that is sort of up for grabs, which is part of the fun of it, you know, because I don't know where it's going. I kind of have, ve I have, I have sort of waypoints that I know I want to reach. Um, and I thought one way to differentiate those books, the first four books at least, would be the first one to be fire. You know, the, it's the, old, the old elements, fire. Mm. The second one, water. The third one, earth. And the, and the fourth one, air. Did I say third? Yeah, 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 that's all good. Third, whatever. Anyway, <laughs> just there's those little things to sort of, you know, just to give a little kind of tonal difference to each one and, you know, and a color palette and all those kind of things. Not, not any kind of like great more in depth than that, but just locations. Because the thing about the character is he, he's, you know, he's like a, a kind of an old fashioned Ronin, like a samurai almost. He's sort of going to these places to sort of fix something that's out of kilter. Um, and then he can move on, you know, and so he can go anywhere. So in the second book, he's in France, here, uh, around here, actually. Um, That's and handy. Traveling through Europe. <laughs> it's very, well, it is. Well, it's, you know, you write what you know, and it's, you know, as I said, it's very in inspirational for me here. And it's like, it's so kind of beautiful and uh, dramatic. Um, the, and it's got lots of history and lots of really good kind of, you know, the, the Albigensian Crusades flowed through here, um, made famous by, you know, Kate Moss with... Um, with labyrinth and um, and you know, and it's you know the Vichy Vichy era era uh, area for the Second World War and the kind of capitulation. So it's like you know there's tons of history. It's very um, it's rich for that, which is you know good for me. Mm, yeah, no, absolutely. And I mean the name Solomon Creed is kind of fascinating in itself. So uh, where, how did you come up with that name? Do you know it just came to me? I know it sounds like you know. So, I mean, I, I I struggle with names because names are really important, and I often change the name of characters loads of times. And and, and sometimes I find writing a character, I might have, be having trouble writing a character. And if I change, just change their name, really think about the name and change their name, it becomes easy or easier um, because I had the name wrong. So it's really important. And when I thought of the idea for this, um, the main idea for this uh, for Solomon Creed, the Searcher, um, the name Solomon Creed just sort of came with it. Um, and it was one of those things that it just seemed so kind of familiar that I was convinced I must have read it somewhere. So I looked it up and Googled it and checked stuff out and, you know, thought, oh, is there a whole series, Solomon Creed series already? And I'm just sort of, you know, I've just forgotten that I'd read it or whatever. Um, and it wasn't. And it was one of those things that I just sort of felt, you know, this, it just feels really, it kind of came ready formed. And it's got good, and as you see, you know, I like names and symbolism, and it's got good connotations because Solomon's an old name and the name of a wise king, um, and creed means, you know, belief system and all this sort of stuff. No, I mean, not that these, I think I'm kind of moved away slightly with this book from the more overtly religious underpinnings of the trilogy. I mean, they're there, but they're not sort of so overt. It's not, you know, whereas the trilogy was about, um, kind of relics that were the mysteries and what were they in this book he is the mystery the central character is the mystery which is a whole different kind of um, challenge actually as a writer to kind of write writing enigmatic on the page is difficult I have discovered it <laughs> Yeah, because you don't want to, you can't give too much away, but you can't let the reader get too frustrated with like 
who is the guy anyway like I, I I won't reveal too much but as I was going through I and I emailed you I was like now I think he's this and now I think he's that you know because you kind of it changes as you read but I wondered um how much of you is in the character of Solomon Creed uh well he's uh, extraordinarily clever uh, <laughs> so <laughs> clearly none um well no I mean well I th- it's hard to say are you I don't know, with you, especially with your main characters, you spend such a long time with them in particular um, that inevitably bits of yourself bleed into them. But I think bits of yourself bleed into all of your characters, good and bad. You remembered know, knowledge or some sort of truth that you have arrived at through your own experience or through people you have met. Um, so, um, yeah, I mean, I, I th- he's not... I would say he's kind of more removed from me than most of my other main characters just because he's so otherworldly, you know. And he also, you know, I'm very chatty and he doesn't say much. He's a, he's a silent, strong, silent type. You know, he sort of keeps his own counsel and is very watchful. Um, and again, that's really hard to write. I, um, it, was a, it was a real challenge. It was probably the hardest book I've ever written this, partly just because it felt like starting again. So there was all the pressure of that, um, you know, starting a whole new world and new story. Um, but also just because normally you... You, you know the center of your main character. Uh, you know what their core is. Even if they've moved away from it and you're, they're trying to get back to it, you kind of know who fundamentally they are or, or if there's a bit missing what that bit is. So that, you know, and that kind of dictates the narrative. And with him, he has no idea who he is. He, don't, he's, he knows literally nothing about himself whatsoever. He just arrives walking down the road, no shoes on his feet, wearing a nice jacket, walking away from a plane crash that he has no knowledge of being on towards a, cow, a town that all he knows is that there's this guy in there he needs to save. That's all he knows. And yet he looks around and, he, you know, everything he looks at, you know, if he looks at the cactus, he knows the name of it, the Latin name of it, the medicinal properties of it, what the, what the uh, Hokum Indians called it. You know, he knows everything about everything. You know, he has this enormous, he has this deep medical knowledge and sort of legal knowledge and, you know, historical knowledge. He, he knows tons of stuff. He has no idea how he knows it, and yet when he thinks about himself, it's just a black hole. It's a blank hole. So that's what he's trying to fill in. So it was, um, it was, yeah. I, he's, he, he was, he's very far removed from me. I think, um, you, and part of the challenge was making someone so other and so sort of um, uncentered um, feel real. And 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 the solution with that actually was by looking at him through all the other characters' eyes, and so they ha- bring you know, they make their own minds up about him based on their own situation. And so you get lots of different perspectives of him. And some people think he's good. Some people think he's um, they're a troublemaker. Some people uh, think he's an angel. Some people think he's, you know, sort of not what you need, some kind of double agent. Opera, you know, he's, and this is the thing is, is I kind of, I lay it all out and it's for you, the reader, to try and kind of double second guess it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but at the end of the book, there is, there is a sort of, well, there's a sort of solution of sorts, which I immediately twist, of course, so that, you know, because, you know, I can't just kind of... T- tell us at can't this tell answer. No, no, but there you go. But it's, um, yeah, no, he was difficult. It was fun, but difficult, really difficult, actually. Mm. And, I mean, you mentioned a little bit, of, you know, that this isn't so religious as, as the Sanctus trilogy, uh, although fans like me obviously like the religious uh, stuff. And there, but, I mean, there still is a kind of um, religious history uh, at the base and there's, you know, the, the church is very important in the book um, and those of us with a religious bent can kind of, like you mentioned the word angel you know can be applied I think um, so how, you know for people who really did love Sanctus what what aspects are they going to find in the book that will satisfy those your current I guess your current fans uh well as you say all of that is in there I mean it's not there are other elements as well there's more sort of modern um kind of crime elements um uh, going on um and it's and also you know it's sort of it's the same it's third person it's multi apart from the very first chapter which is first person that's a little departure um which is the only time you're in solomon's head uh, when he really knows nothing about himself so there's you don't, you don't really learn much uh, other than his confusion um uh, so it's third person short chapters m- constantly changing point of view very i mean it's very cinematic my my background you know when i st- studied i studied um i mean i did a degree in english but i studied um screenplays as much as books um and i i think for thrillers um that cinematic technique of having short chapters and changing point of view and third person so that the reader knows as much knowledge as possible is is and and a kind of real time story as well um is sort of the best 
it's the, well, I think it's the best mechanism for, or the best kind of engine for telling the story of a thriller and propelling story forward. Um, but so, the, so there's all of that is the same as the trilogy. Um, and there's lots of twists, you know, there's lots of kind of char- and there's lots of characters who you're not quite sure whether they're good or bad or they're morally ambiguous so that you know they're bad, but somehow you like them because they're sort of doing noble things. They're doing bad things for good reasons. All that, you know, I love all that. I love that kind of like sort of, you know, moral fog. Um, I just think it's real. I think, you know, people are constantly, you know, there are no really good people and there are really no really bad people in the main. You know, people are just sort of, you know, there is good in everyone, there's bad in everyone. Um, and that's what makes it real. Um, so, yeah, so I, th- I mean, I, I, the pace is the same, I, I think. And um, it's got a big kind of, uh, a big reveal, a big twist reveal ending, um, which I think is very similar. I think if you read it and you you, you could tell it's me, um, even if the subject matter sort of is slightly skewed to a different direction. But it's not it's not like a huge departure. It's not like I've written kind of some bodice ripping romance or anything. <laughs> So uh, one of the interesting things, of course, is the difference between the UK and the US uh, cover and title. Just talk a bit about that so people don't get confused when they look for the book. Uh, Well, it's um, in America and Canada. It's called The Searcher um, and has a very different cover of a man running down a road um, in Arizona. And, uh, And in the UK and Commonwealth, so Australia, New Zealand, South Africa. Um, it's called Solomon Creed, um, and it's a sort of black and white image of a man walking towards you, um, and that's it. And it's like it's one of those things. It's um, I think books often get their their titles changed, and readers find it slightly baffling and slightly annoying as well because they end up buying the same book twice with a different name. So I'm at pains to say it's just one book. It's not like I've been super productive and produced two books that are coming out within a month of each other. Uh, that would be a nice thing. Um, uh, but no, it's not. It's and it's. it's I, you know, they, they. You've got to trust your publishers that they know their their uh, market and that they are going to um, give do the best cover and title that is going to appeal to those readers. Which is, I, you know, so I don't have. They they show me the cover. They're both very nice covers. Um, really nice, really good covers. Um, and the story is the same. So hopefully, it will find readers everywhere. I'm sure it will. And there's, uh, I hear there might be some rumours of some TV or something. Uh, yes, it was. Uh, it was the cause of much, much consternation and uh, regret that um, uh, the the trilogy. Because I come from TV, it would have been lovely. You know, I was sort of had this idea of that one of them would get turned into a TV series. And even though everyone goes, "Oh, these are so visual," you think, "When are they going to be a film?" And uh, the trilogy is still remains unoptioned and uh, and unlikely to turn into anything visual. However, Solomon, the searcher. Um, has been attracting lots of attention, uh, which has been very nice from various um, uh, American uh, studios, Hollywood studios. Uh, and it's been one of those things where I've kind of been dying to talk about it, but I haven't been able to because it's all, you know, sort of until it's the deal's done and it's been an, uh, been announced. Um, but I can reveal uh, that um, The Searcher slash Solomon Creed has been optioned by Leonardo DiCaprio's company, Appian Way, for a, to develop into a TV series. Yeah, which is really good with, uh, in conjunction with E1, which is a big producer of lots of fine dramas. Uh, so that's very exciting. Um, I've literally signed the contract. I haven't even sort of spoken to them much about it yet. But, um, and I know these things, you know, often kind of go, uh, take ages or go nowhere or, you know, sort of, uh, it's, a, it's a very kind of serpentine path to getting anything made. But it's just great, and I think you know they do make some brilliant stuff, and um, and I think Solomon the Searcher is very um, would be a really good TV series. I mean, no, I'd say that, but it just it's very episodic, and it's you know it, it's um, it's kind of split into ten parts as well, so it's almost kind of like ready made as a TV mm. series. Um, right. So I wondered what other thriller authors do you like reading because this will go out in the big thrill, and uh, people are always looking for their next read after they've read The Searcher slash Solomon Creed. <laughs> Obviously. What else should they? Uh, what else should After they? That. Uh, well, I um, I kind of just I sort of this year early, I was one of the judges for the one of the ITW um, prizes, so I read like two hundred and fifty. I kind of went through two hundred and fifty books, and I read a whole chunk of them. Um, 
And um, and there's some brilliant writers out there. There really are. You know, it was a tough job even kind of narrowing it down. And then, you know, fortunately, I didn't have to pick the winner. Someone else did. Um, and so, I, you know, from that, from recent reads, um, I really love Steve Berry. I think he's great. Um, he's just, he's really good because I don't know that much about American history. And so you can read Steve Berry and learn tons about American history because it's so well researched. Whilst at the same time, you know, he's got this brilliant central character, Cotton Malone, and they're really good kind of, you know, thrillery engines that kind of move along and twist and turn and stuff. Um, I like, um, I can't, who else I like reading? Um, uh, Greg Isles is a brilliant writer. Um, his is one of the books, Natchez Burning. I haven't read the same. It's the first of a trilogy, which is brilliant. It's sort of, you know, again, it was... It was interesting because I was writing uh, Sol the finishing off Solomon then, and his sort of dots around and has it's more recent history, but it's still in the South, and you know that whole kind of sins of the fathers surfacing in the present kind of stuff. Um, and he's just a very you know he's a very elegant writer and very powerful writer. And I think this book, he, I mean, he's been a bestseller for years, but I think this book Natchez Burning, he's he lives in Natchez, and it's obviously extraordinarily dear to him. You can feel it; you can feel the passion in the pay. You know, it's like the book he was almost gearing up to read. Um, and I haven't read the next one. The next one, The Bone Tree, I haven't read. Um, so that's due to be read next. Um, I read a lot of Cormac McCarthy. Um, not strictly a thriller writer, but um, um, No Country for Old Men is sort of thrillery, crimery, crimey. Um, There's a lot of death in his architecture. Books. There is a no yeah, but a lot of it happens off the page. You know, if you read No Country for Old Men. Almost no. I can't think of anything. Oh, there's a couple of deaths that happen on the page, but most of the all the massacres, all the kind of shootouts, the mm. stuff that normally you would devote pages to, all happen off the page. Mm. You know, it's sort of it, you gear up to it, and then you cut to the aftermath with the sheriff. You know, the the marshal kind of rolling all kind of, which is brilliant. And again, very original way of doing it because he's more interested in the aftermath of stuff rather than you know the violence. Um, you know, the, the consequences of violence rather than the violence itself. Mm, fantastic. Well, I think that's probably enough <laughs> for readers to go away with. Um, so where can people find you and the books online? Uh, well, I have a website, simontoyne.net, um, and all of uh, all links to everything really goes through that. All the kind of um, pre-orders for anything, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Waterstones, everywhere uh, can be uh, clicked through on there. Uh, plus any all the events that I'm doing, um, I'm doing quite a few events um, in the UK mainly um, uh, around publication time um, and Solomon Creed's out in September in the UK and uh, the Commonwealth and October the 6th in North America and Canada. Um, so I'm doing loads of stuff online and off for that and all details are on my website simontoyne.net. Fantastic, thanks so much for your time Simon, that was brilliant. Thanks again, but do it again next year. <laughs>